in the next several weeks that we study this book, it's important that we don't stay the same, right? It's important that after today we're not the same because the Bible says that the word is transforming. It transforms us. It renews us. It changes us. So let's just be eager and let's be intentional about this book and how God can change us through this book. So um, I always like to set for myself a goal. Like, Lord, at the end of this book, I want to be blank. And I would like you just to think about that, write it down if you're taking notes. Um, but say, I want to be this at the end of this book. We're calling the, the book, the series, we're calling it God Is. Because in this book, John, who would be so qualified to know who God is, and we're going to see that this morning right off the bat. But he, he, he wants us, he wants the readers, he wants us to have a correct understanding of God. A right understanding of God. Is that important? Is it important that we understand God correctly? It couldn't be more important. Because it has to do with how we relate to God. So a proper view of God, a proper understanding of God, helps us to rightly relate with God. So he says, and if you're taking notes, there's, there's three big things that he says about God and kind of works those things out. He says, first, that God is light. And then in chapter 3, he says that God is love. And then in chapter 5, he says God is life. And so he works those things out with, with the, the, the understanding and the idea that he wants us as Christians to be assured of our faith, to be free to walk with God without doubt. And he wants us to be anchored in the truth and the reality of the person and work of Jesus Christ. So this morning, as he writes this book, and John's interesting because church tradition tells us that all of the disciples were martyred for their faith, except for John. Now, that wasn't without trying because they tried to kill John. Church tradition tells us that they put John in a pot of boiling water and it didn't work. And so instead, they exiled him to the island of what? Patmos. Patmos. Patmos being there was worse than any prison sentence you can have. It was not a fun, it wasn't Hawaii. He was out there suffering. It, it was a, a, another long, slow, suffering death. But he wrote the book of Revelation there, didn't he? So we have God's plan unfolding in so many different ways. But then John, the, there's a change in um, government. So John was let out. And so he was the last living a disciple and he would go around and speak to churches and as John went around and sp spoke to churches people would be excited to hear what what he had to say and the crowd would come imagine John who walked with Jesus the last living uh, disciple he's coming to speak and he would walk up he was in his hundreds and he'd walk up there and he would say brethren love one another and walk away <laughs> and you may say well that doesn't sound like they got their money's worth <laughs> but they did because they didn't pay for one just kidding but they did because that that was the essential message of Christianity he got that from Jesus the message to to love God with all your heart mind, soul, and strength, and then to love one another. That's, that's the message of Christianity. So this morning, as we look into this first section, we're going to have communion this morning as well, but we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 4, and we're calling it the joy-filled life. He starts off with encouraging us 
to have joy. I'd like us to be thinking about and maybe ask ourselves the question, could, could we honestly say our heart is filled with joy? It's possible. Sometimes it doesn't even think, seem like that's possible, is it? But in the Bible where God gives us a command, He also gives us the enabling. Joy is important. Joy is not something that's a, a byproduct of um, circumstances and situations, which is called happiness. Do we like to be happy? Amen. We like to be happy. I was really happy when I got the news. Actually, um, Brother Miguel sent it to me. I don't know if he's here or he might be out there. He told me that there's a, a new study out that says that eating cake, chocolate cake, in the morning is actually beneficial to your health. Did you guys see that? I was so happy. Especially after um, Rosemary made me a German chocolate cake. <laughs> and I was feeling guilty about my partaking of that. And, and then I, I read that article and it said there's actually health benefits of eating chocolate cake in the morning. So I was really happy. And then I was really sad because then I realized I didn't have any chocolate cake in the morning. <laughs> and so it's this yo-yo kind of up and down feelings of emotions, that's how happiness is. Happiness is completely dependent on things going right in our life. It's conditional upon circumstances. So is it ever possible to be happy in it for a sustained amount of time? Everything would have to be just perfect, wouldn't it? It's not possible. But joy is. And joy and happiness are very similar in their characteristics. In their feelings, they're very similar. The difference is joy is constant and sustainable because it's dependent on a person who is constant and sustainable and unchangeable, Jesus Christ. Amen. Happiness is completely tied to circumstances. So John, it's interesting how he starts his letter. Think about John. Think about all he's gone through, all the suffering and difficulty and heartache. Think about his journey of life that's taken him so far. And he starts off this, this letter stressing the importance of joy. Why is joy so important? Why is it essential? Well, Joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? In Galatians, Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and he goes on. But think about this. Think about this. We're to walk in the Spirit, right? We're to live our life as Christians in the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. How we, gauge, how we gauge that, how we understand that, how we realize if we're actually walking in the Spirit is if our life is filled internally with love and then that love is manifested externally. And part of that then is there would be great joy. Joy really is the experience of God's love. So that's a good way for us to understand and think about, am I really walking in the Spirit? Because I'm bummed out all the time. Walking in the Spirit, then a byproduct of that is joy. Now you may be saying, well, things are hard. I have really hard things in my life and difficult things in my life. I understand that. And I'm not saying, and the Bible doesn't say it's easy. It's saying if it's possible if we understand a few things. And we can't look at John and say, well, of course John was joyful. I mean, he had it so easy. We can't look at Paul or the apostles, the disciples, and say, well, of course they could be joyful. We can't say it. They've taken all that off the table, living such difficult, hard lives in this world, 
and they still had joy. They still had joy. So if, if you're not joyful now, don't beat yourself up, but let's take a step of faith and let's look at what the Bible says and let's open our hearts up and say, I need to be joyful. And here's how. Does that sound good? Can we do that at least? Let's take a look. So the joyful life. John comes out like Muhammad Ali. Full force, pulling no punches, no small talk to start it off. He doesn't warm us up. Look at what he says in verse 1. He just hits us right smack dab in the face. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So all of this is headed towards verse 4, which says that, He's writing this so that our joy may be full. So there's the purpose there, okay? Number one, if you're taking notes, to, to understand if we're going to have joy, number one, we have to understand the source of joy. That's so important. So often we're, we're looking for joy in the wrong places. He tells us right off the bat, Joy comes from one place. There's one fountain, one spring, one river, one source of joy. And he's explaining that. And he's explaining it in a very certain way, which is interesting because he uses similar language than the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the first statement of the Bible. What does it say? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you got it right. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. See, that's important. He starts off saying that which was from the beginning. His wording is such that he's saying there was an eternal pre-existing being before anything came into existence that we know of. That which was, it was from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, the, the Bible works out Genesis chapter 1, which says, in the beginning, God. And then God works that out. The theology of God is worked out in the totality of the Bible. But see, if we would just take Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, if we would just take that, we are starting off on the right foot. We, were, we are starting off connecting with the source of everything, the beginning of everything, the ruler of everything, the controller of everything. We have to start with God. So if we're going to talk about joy, John would say, you have to start talking about God. You're not going to be able to talk about, if you're going to talk about joy, you can't talk about, man, if, if this job comes through, or if I pass high school, or if I get my GED, or if I'm super successful, or if this happens or this happens, then we have to stop thinking like that. The Bible tells us that regardless of any circumstance and situation, the source of joy is one thing. And, and he talks about that. He says, so that which was from the beginning, he says, we, we have heard... So John spent time with Jesus, right? So he, he heard the things that Jesus said. He heard his teaching. He heard his interaction with people. He heard the things he said about heaven, about earth, about life, about sin and death. He, Jesus gave the 
explanation of everything we know about life. And that's why he's saying, we heard from this one that was from the beginning. Now, I think, man, how cool would that be? How amazing would that be to walk with Jesus, to hear the things he said? He's the one who made everything. They didn't get it at that time, did they? But here we are. We have his, his words, the things that he said, and we have an eyewitness that was walking with Jesus. And he say, he's saying, I heard him say these things. You won't even believe it. The things that he said, I've heard him say these things, but he's saying, that's not enough. He's saying, not only did we hear these things, he says, our eyes have seen these things. We, we saw this being, this person, this real human being. We, we saw him. He would talk about life, death, heaven, eternity, salvation. And then we saw him. He would heal people. We saw him do these miracles. We saw him do things like walking on water. But then John saw him die. And then John saw him alive again. Talk about a tipping point, right? How would you feel if you saw somebody die and then they're alive again? Like fully dead, like really dead, like few days dead, and then they're alive again. He saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration in his glorified body. And it wasn't just him. Do you notice? It, he's not just saying it's just me. He said us. I think that's important. Because he's not asking us just to believe him. There are over 500 witnesses to the resurrected Jesus Christ. John himself was one who was radically changed because of the difference that he saw in Jesus' death and then his resurrection. He says, we saw, but notice what he says next. He says, which we have looked upon. That Greek word is a, the same word that we get theater from. That means they stared and watched contemplatively. That means it wasn't just some quick little thing. It means they stared at him. They examined his life. They examined the things that he did. And then he says, our hands have handled him. He was physical. Why is that important? It's important because John is dealing with a group of people in which now many of the cults arise out of this very same thinking. It's called Gnosticism. Have you ever heard that? Gnosticism, the Gnostics. The word means literally knowledge. The Gnostics would say that they had super knowledge. That you can't know God unless you went to one of their super duper knowledgeable guys. The average person, they couldn't know God. And Gnostics would go around and they would say, well, Jesus couldn't have come bodily because material and flesh is, is evil and sinful, wicked. So Jesus couldn't have come in the flesh. But they said the spirit is what is pure and holy and untainted with sin and evil. So the applications of that would be that they would say, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. You can go and sin as much as you want and do whatever you want. It doesn't matter because your body's sinful anyway. It's the, the spiritual part of that. So that would be one application of that. Another application would be because their body was sinful, then they would, they would do things to their body, to harm their body, to injure their body, so that their body wouldn't have control of them. So the Gnostics would teach that Jesus didn't raise bodily. So that's why he's saying, we touched him. That was important. When Jesus rose again, he was physical. He wasn't a phantom. Jesus rose physically. And Jesus ate with the disciples. 
John saying we touched him. He was a physical being. That's important. But then he says this. He says all that. Now he puts a name on that. This, we get the name. He says the word of life. The word of life. He uses a specific term because it, it means something. The word of life. We touched him. We heard him. We studied him. We handled him. We saw him. It, and it was the word of life. The word of life is an expression or a way to get us to understand that Jesus is the communication of God the Father to human beings in our own language. So the Bible says that we can't know the Father unless we know the Son. So Jesus came as a human being. John in his uh, gospel says in the same thing in the beginning of his gospel. He says, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. So that was a thing to, God, uh, to John. That was a thing to him that, that we understood that Jesus... God the Son and God the Father are one in the same. Of course, we're talking about the Trinity now. And then the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, which means God is one in three persons. It's distinct, separate persons, but also one, equally one, and that's the Trinity. So we worship one God in three persons. And Jesus then, the word of life, he was the one who came as a human being, taken on human flesh and blood, God with us, Emmanuel, to show us in our own language eternal life to show us the heart of the Father. And that word life is interesting. That's, that word life there is zoe, Z-O-E or zoe. And that means, it doesn't mean existing. There's a Greek word for existing, which is bio, like biology. It just means you're alive, you have breath. The word zoe or zo is fullness of life, the full expression of life. That's important. Because John's saying Jesus came as the word of life to give us fullness of life, not just so that we exist. That's important for our joy. It's not about just existing, but it, now it's about eternal life that Jesus came to give, eternal life. Jesus came to give eternal life. That's not just a length of time. Eternal life is a quality of life. The word means a fullness of life. It means vitality. It means full expression of who we are. It means not just existing. It means thriving and living and enjoying and connecting with God and with people in God. So much to that. So number one, number one, the source of joy. Takeaway. If we're, if we're going to have true, sustainable fullness of joy, we have to know where it comes from. Number two, verse two. So now he says the source of joy has, in verse two, has been manifested. So the source of joy says then life was manifested. That means that it, it was made visible. For example, I'm thinking something right now. And then you don't know what I'm thinking. You could guess and have some assumptions. Does anybody want to guess what I'm thinking? Chocolate yes, chocolate cake. <laughs> I guess I'm very predictable. But it, not until I speak it then you know what, what is in my mind. The words are the manifestation of my thoughts. Jesus was the manifestation 
of God in human form. So he says that life was manifested. And do you think he really wants us to get this? We have seen, we bear witness, and now we declare to you, we're, we're telling you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So not only is Jesus the source of joy, but he's also now the opening to joy or the key to joy. That it's made, been made possible and acceptable, uh, accessible, I should say. So joy is accessible. So now we, we know where to go for joy. And now we know that we have an invitation, that we're, we're allowed to come to the source of joy to experience life of joy and something key about that is he's he's talking about joy is a spiritual thing joy is an internal thing there is no source of joy outside of god but this is the the key it's in the spirit so it's not in a thing. It's not in a material thing. So joy comes in the spirit, which is an inter internal thing. And that's what he's saying. He said, now Jesus was manifested in the flesh. And now we're declaring to you that eternal life that was with the Father, now it's manifest to us. The mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God became man so man can know God. Mind-blowing to think about. Incredible to meditate on that, that, that God that has no beginning, that eternal God that has no creator, no beginning, that existed in eternity past, he has now come into time into the material world as a material being, 100% human and yet 100% God at the same time. And he did it all for us. And he didn't just come into the world as a human being to be king of the world at that time. He came to die for us. Why? So we could know him so we can know eternal life and we can know life in the spirit. Real life is life in the spirit. Real life is experiencing God in spirit and in truth. And that's why so many for ages upon ages have tried to find happiness satisfaction that is lasting and substantial in this world and will always, always, always come up short. It is impossible. Sure, happiness is possible, but it's fleeting. There's pleasure in sin for a season. But to come into a relationship with God is to know the source of joy personally and to know how to enjoy the things that God has for us, so crucial. So the third thing, the third point, is then how do we experience this joy? So this, this, this huge understanding of this huge God that has been manifest to us so we can know him personally. Now watch this. This is why John is so excited. He said, do you think this is important? That which we have seen and heard and declare to you, that's really important. He really wants us to know. I've seen him. I've heard it. He really wants to. And now he's saying, I'm declaring to you. I'm, I'm telling you. I'm telling you as a guy who has been changed, a guy who has experienced God in the flesh personally, I'm telling you like he wants him to know so bad. He says, here's what I want you to know, that you may have fellowship with us. You say, 
I want you to come on into this amazing thing. The door is open for all to have eternal life, to all to know the God of the universe personally. That's why he says fellowship. And then he says, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, and these things we write to you, what does that say? That your joy may be full. Guys, John didn't get that from himself. Did you know that? You know where he got that? He got that from Jesus himself. John 15, 11, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. John 16, 24, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. John 17, 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And so John's declaring it. And here's the thing. I'm just going to... Give us a few points to look at to make this really practical. Joy, fullness of joy is possible, but it's not certain. And it all depends on us. That's what John's saying. It's not an automatic. Spurgeon the 1800s preacher from England said this, too many Christians are passive in their loss of joy. They need to realize that it is a great loss and do everything they can to draw close to God and reclaim that fullness of joy. If any of you have lost the joy of the Lord, I pray that you do not think it a small loss. What Spurgeon's saying, what John's saying, what we need to understand today is we need to fight for our joy. We need to, it is important. Joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy stabilizes us. Joy is a witness to the world of the goodness of God and joy is a fruit of walking in the Spirit. So how can we do that? A couple of things. And when I say couple, I don't mean two. That's just a general, generic statement. How could we be filled with joy and have sustainable joy? Okay, John tells us one thing. There's one thing, and it's fellowship with God. The Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy. It's one thing. It's fellowship with God. What does that mean? Fellowship, that word means koinonia. It's a Greek word. That word fellowship means sharing a life with, common life. It means the closest possible intimate connection that anybody could possibly have. It's, it's a shared union. And we're to walk in that. So it's one thing. If you just want to make it really easy, it's just walking in fellowship with God is where our joy comes from. So that suggests that we lose our joy from not walking in fellowship with God. That's helpful because then we can think, man, I don't, I don't feel joy. I I've, can't get out of this funk. We see in the book of Psalms so often the writer would say, oh man, I'm downcast. I'm bummed out. My, my countenance is weary and weak and my enemies are surrounding me and things are so terrible. But then I'll say something like, but then the Lord. Or then I meditated upon the Lord. Or then I thought of God and the whole thing turned around. So, fellowship with God. Now, 
we all know as human beings then, there's so many things looking to steal our joy, looking to rob us of our joy. So many things. And the Bible, Bible says that our, our joy can never be taken away from us if we stay in fellowship with the Lord. So, how do we do that? Couple things. Couple things. Don't focus on joy. Focus on the king of joy. Focus on the eternal things. Number one. Good possibility that we're bummed out all the time, that we're struggling so hard. Good possibility is that our mind is set on material and earthly things. That we can't get our focus off the world. And here's a guarantee. If that's what we're thinking about, we can almost be guaranteed we're not going to have joy. Bible says, in this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So if Jesus says, in this world you have tribulation, and the world is a, a fallen world, not that there, we can find wonderful, beautiful, great things in this world, but if our mindset is, is set here, we're not going to have joy. What we do then practically is when we start to get bummed out, there's probably some root in some material, worldly, earthly circumstance or situation that's taking over our minds and our thoughts, which eventually takes over our heart. And the Bible says that we're to seek the things that are above, to set our minds on the things above. So that's number one. That we're to Focus on Jesus and on the eternal. The, the next thing. Be deliberate in rejoicing. Be deliberate about it. See, we can always rejoice in the Lord regardless of our feelings. We can always rejoice in the Lord. We may not have feelings of happiness or joy, but we can always rejoice in the Lord. You see what I'm saying? So the Bible teaches us, Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. That's a commandment. One way to affect our joy is to rejoice in, in the Lord. That's something that we can always do, no matter what's going on, that Jesus is so wonderful and beautiful and has done so much that we can always rejoice in him. Number three, be deliberate in praise. Be deliberate in praise. So these are things that, that are, are not things that we're, we're subject to our feelings or whatever. These are things that we're just doing because he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to to give our honor. And so we're, we're praising him. We're worshiping him. There's a great scripture, Psalm 73, 23. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you. So sometimes we're, we're waiting for the joy lightning bolt to hit us. And that's not correct. Don't wait for joy to find you. Rejoice in the Lord always and praise the Lord always and you and I will find then that our feelings of joy will be experienced as we rejoice in the Lord, praise the Lord, and focus on the Lord. Number four. Don't count your life dear to yourself. Possibly a big reason that you're so bummed out, so concerned, is that your own personal life is too important to you. Does that sound weird? Aren't we to, you know, make a big deal about our life and think? 
Paul said this. This is interesting. Paul was going to Jerusalem, and the, uh, it was prophesied that he would be bound up there and killed. And here's what he says. None of these things move me. His buddies were trying to talk him out of it. None of these things, it didn't bother me. I'm not worried about it. Nor, he says, nor do I count my life dear to myself. You know what he's saying? It's not about me. He said, I'm not trying to hold on to my life in this world. It's, it's not about what I get and what I do and what I have. It's not about my reputation. He said, I, basically, he said, I'm, I don't care about those things. I care about God's things, and my life is in God's hands. He says, I don't count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. I may finish my race with joy. That's the secret. See, we can't be all absorbed with ourselves and our life in this world and our problems in this world. We can't be all absorbed with that and be joyful. But when we put our lives in God's hands and we say, it's just not about, I'm not holding on to my life and what I want and my things. And we can honestly, truly say in our heart, Lord, your will be done. We are free from circumstances, situations, and things that are ever-changing in life and in our world. And the only way we can do that is by the power of the Lord in Jesus Christ through the Spirit, surrendering our will to Him moment by moment, day by day. And when we do that, we are free, free to fellowship with the Lord and have the joy of the Lord. Remember, the joy is not ours. The joy is the Lord's that he shares with us. And so this morning, as we take communion, maybe that's something we want to take a step of faith today. Maybe it's time that we untie our connections to the world and to our circumstances and we let those things be in God's hands. We let God handle those things so that we can be free to worship the Lord. And that's actually what God wants. You know, the Bible says we can't add one cubit to our life by worrying. Has worrying ever fixed anything for you? Has it ever helped anything? Man, the Lord is good. Let's pray, and then we're going to take communion this morning.